what, what cost that is yeah, yeah, and I suppose what I'm to be forgiven. Yeah, what I'm trying to do here is define what I mean by forgiveness. Yes. Right. Rather than what the world means by forgiveness. Okay. Do you follow me? But because I mean, close. Because in a yeah, it's very close. In in the Christian beliefs and in the you know New Age type beliefs, forgiveness is held up as like a sort of a pinnacle about your own progression. <coughs> and to be honest with you, it is. Forgiveness is such an important part of your own progression. But the key is understanding what it is. <laughs> understanding, you know, that it's not what most people believe it to be. Forgiveness is when inside, this is when forgiveness is complete, you will inside of your own heart not have any emotion about all of the events that occurred and you will be fully emotionally connected to every event. Forgiveness is when you are fully emotionally connected to every event that's happened to you throughout your entire life and you no longer have any emotional hurt about any of those events. That's impossible. It's not impossible. It feels impossible, but it's not possible, Dennis. Okay, how does that relate to forgiving yourself? The same applies, actually. Same. But, but like, so you have to forgive all these other things before you can actually forgive yourself, or is it just related to the one topic? Well, so they're all related to the same topic. The reason why we often can't forgive these things in others is because we can't forgive them in ourselves. <coughs> Because we feel so ashamed, or you know, we're not willing to feel and process the emotions of shame, guilt, and all of those other types of emotions. So, do we need to forgive ourselves first? And usually, it's a process that happens in current currently. Oh, yes. So, I think that's the personal and generational. And we're talking personal, generational, and everything. everything. In the end, you will get to a point where every single thing. Well, you think about it. Where's God in on the point of forgiveness? It has no meaning to God really in the end. Because every single thing that's ever been done and ever will be done, God's already forgiven. Do you follow me? So you will actually get to that place too. It has no emotional signature in God. Do you understand that? Like, like God does not get angry with the murderer. Why? Free well, he's got a heap of laws, firstly, that all correct it. And he's got free will. God's got no judgment about it. But the murderer has to be with that himself. Certainly, God created all these laws that to create automatic things on the soul, which automatically corrects the action. So it's not like the person gets away with anything. That's what unconditional love is. For all of us to see. And when you're at one with God, this is how you will feel. So if I have any emotion inside of me whatsoever about all of these big things, right, then I'm not yet at a state where I'll be at one with God. And so then we go down the track, but hey, what are you asking of us? Like, you're asking the impossible. That's what it feels like, doesn't it? Yeah. In a way. And forgiveness means that I don't have any emotional response inside of me at all, even if you came up and bopped me in the nose. What I mean by compassion then is... So am I automatically compassionate to you, though, in that state? Yes. yes. Well, of course. It's because if you know yourself where you've been and what it's done, and you know that you've been But if you take that to a further extension, that's saying that if I haven't experienced what you have experienced, I can never forgive you. And that's not true either. I don't have to experience what you are now experiencing or directing at me before I can forgive you. Is so that it's fun? not the same, it's not, you can't equate forgiveness with compassion, it's another emotion. 
compassion is a different emotion. The compassion certainly is involved in forgiveness, but compassion is actually more involved in this emotion of mercy, which we'll talk about as a different subject a little later. Does everyone get to what I'm saying about forgiveness, though? Mm -hmm. So you will get to a stage in your own progression where you will actually feel no angry, hurtful, harmful emotions towards anyone else and because everything inside of you has been dealt with to such an extent that you are fully connected with every event that's ever happened to you and yet you are totally loving and totally open emotionally to all of those events. Then you're at one with God. That will happen probably just before you're on with God. And what we're doing is we're growing to that stage. Because when you get to that stage, nothing will trigger you. When you get to that stage, yeah, the, you, you, you know that there's nothing, in fact, that is actually happening to you. But you don't know that here. It's not an intellectual state. It's an emotional state. You feel it. You see, with all of these things, this is why it's so important, the emotion part is so important. Every single quality that I've ever talked about in my entire life has all revolved around an emotional state of beingness, not an intellectual state of beingness. Right? So you cannot intellectually manufacture this state of forgiveness. You can think you have, but you won't have. Right? It's only when you feel it completely. So. So who of you feels angry? In, in the face of that last week, who was angry? I was angry. <coughs> right? We are not in a state of forgiveness yet. You get to a state where every single event is forgiven as it occurs. So somebody can come up, bop you in the nose, and you know that event as it's occurring. You'll even get to a state where you know it's going to occur and you'll have already forgiven it. That's a very powerful state. Have you seen my life, Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's where I was at. <laughs> and I hope to be there again. <laughs> Understand that truth and error are automatic attractors. Do you understand that? In other words, the people who are in the most error often need the pers a person in a lot of truth to trigger their error. And quite often there is an emotional response in the people in error. Error and truth will always enter into a confrontation. And this is something you need to get used to in your own life. You get to a point where you're not afraid of that. Where you're not afraid of the confrontation between truth and error. Right? And that's where I was in the first century. I was not afraid of the confrontation between truth and error. My own crucifixion was the result of the confrontation between truth and error. So you're dropping your reactivity. It's not an intellectual dropping of your reactivity. No, 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 no. There is nothing in you that gets triggered by what the person has done to you anymore. Uh -huh. so there's no there's just no reaction other than love. <laughs> Doesn't the body then want to still self-protect itself and move out of the way because it loves itself? When you say, doesn't the body want to do something for itself, your soul has total control over your body. Okay. Yeah, body and soul, the whole package. Doesn't it want to move out of the way? No, God didn't make your soul with the need to protect itself. That is an actual emotional error that has come through generations of man. The reality is that when you get into that state of beingness, you'll realize that everything is automatically protected. There's nothing you can do to lose your life. It doesn't matter if you break your nose. Like it doesn't matter if somebody cuts open your heart and jumps up and down on it. You will still not lose your life. All you've lost is... Your heart. No, the body. <laughs> and you will actually feel more alive the instant after it occurs than you have ever felt your entire life here on earth. Is that what every spirit feels yep. when they pass? More, more alive. alive. Wow. Yeah. More alive. Yeah. Many of you have this concept still within your heart, right, that this is the real life and the spirit life is not really the real life. Right? And I'm telling you that, you know what? 
this isn't the real life, the spirit life isn't even the real life either. You'll get to a point in your own progression in the 22nd sphere when you've actually gone through the soul union state. You'll start realising for the first time what the real life is. And it is so powerful and so wonderful and so extreme in terms of bliss that you'll wonder what in the hell you were thinking when you were doing this thing. <laughs> <laughs> here, right? That's how it is. That's how it is. <laughs> don't do that, because that's breaking one of God's laws of harmony of love, right? So don't do that. But I'm just explaining to you what it's really like. We often are so attached to this body of ours, thinking that for some reason if I lose this body, my life is going to lose some kind of significance or lose some kind of joy. In reality, it's just going to gain more. So what are you worried about? What we're worried about is all the projections of fear and, up, and all the projections of this long history of mankind walking away from God. That's what we're worried about. That's the emotion in me that I need to release. Does that make sense? But that's an aside. Because I was talking about forgiveness. <laughs> well, I think that when you die, you feel when I die, well, better. But then you're telling us on that first level, is he's baddies who... I, I am telling you, and this is getting off the subject, but I am telling you that where you will go will be the direct mirror of what your soul condition is currently, whatever that be. And yes, in some cases that will be quite bad, because we're not dealing with some emotions that are quite deep and dark and really, really harmful to ourselves and others. If we deal with those emotions here on earth, wherever we go will be quite good, or even Great or even maybe even celestial. Just depends on the condition that we get into now on earth. So that's what I'm going to say. Yeah. Um, with the forgiveness, like you know, going back for a while when I was at school, um, like grade four to uh, ten, that you know, I always think, well, I used to go to Mara's Brothers and I'd get a cane like every day or or every second day. Yeah. And it was really, really cruel. Yeah. And I get, when I tell the story, I get really um, you know, emotional and, and I've got a lot of hate for those brothers. Yep. And, um, and, and, and I always sort of think, well, you know, they were just, they were just doing their job. But then I, then I, I can see the faces on some of those blokes and they were just hateful. And they were enjoying what they were doing. Yeah. yeah. What will happen, Gary, is as you process all of your emotion about what happened, you will release lots and lots of emotions. Some of it will be anger, some of it will be hatred, some of it will be deeper than that, grief and sadness. And once you get to the bottom of those emotions, you will have already forgiven them. There will no longer be this feeling of hatred towards them. It will no longer be in you. Because all of the results of what they created are no longer in you. Does that make sense? It seems to take a long time though. Well, that's why I want to discuss the rest of it, because it can be a lot shorter. <laughs> but yeah, I understand. When you look at it from a purely, like, from a purely how much has been done to me point of view, and particularly I know in your life, like your life has been when you add that to what your mother has done and a few other things, it's pretty, that's pretty full on life. And, and so, you know, there's this feeling of how could I ever, ever be in a state where I'll forgive that. You know? And I'm not saying for you to now manufacture this, you heard AJ talk about forgiveness, oh, well now what I'll do is I'll go around forgiving everybody. <laughs> no, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting that you're going to have to be feeling and processing through a lot of emotion to get to this state of forgiveness in reality. That's what I'm suggesting to you. Yeah. But I want to also make sure that the rest of the things, <laughs> that because it's really important to see the relationship between all of these things. You follow me? Yeah. All right. So can I... Yeah. Just one more, one more question. You talk about uh, the law of attraction, like attracts like. Mm -hmm. okay. But then you just said that... Um, Error and truth bump up against each other, which is obvious it does, but, but can you resolve those two things? No emotion reaction. Error and truth, the error and truth attraction is a like attracting like attraction, it's a sympathetic attraction.
can everyone see that? So, um, let me give you another example of another type of attraction, and you'll see the relationship. If I'm in a state of fear, what am I going to attract? Fear. fear. No. Something that will hurt you. I will actually more than often attract things that create my fear, which is usually what? Other people's anger. Or can you see how, when I say it's a sympathetic attraction, a law of attraction event, another person's anger might be the creator of my fear. You follow me? They are not the same emotion, right? But there is a light, there is a sympathetic attraction occurring between those two states. One needs the other in order to be released. You follow me? And it's the same with truth and error. No, one needs the other. One needs the other in order for the error to be released. There's a sympathetic attraction. There's a sympathetic attraction between truth and error. There's a sympathetic attraction between anger and fear. There's, a sympath there's lots of sympathetic attractions like that. If I want to use you, you've got to have an attraction where you're willing to be used. Do you follow me? That's a sympathetic attraction. Could I use somebody who has an attraction where they don't want to be used? No. Impossible for me to influence them. Did you see that? So that's what I mean by a law, it's a law of attraction. But remember, the law of attraction doesn't mean it's the same emotion. Yes, it's not like and like, it's synthetic. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, they're getting all angry at you because you've got all this anger in you. That doesn't necessarily follow, you know. You know, that is something that we've come up with in New Age philosophy, perhaps, but it doesn't necessarily follow. You could be just full of fear and terror, and that's what attracts their anger. What attracts a dog to bite you? It's not because you went up and kicked the dog, was it? That didn't attract the dog to bite you in most cases, did it? What was it? It was your own fear. Yeah. So you can see how, even in those kinds of events, they're not, they're not the same emotion that creates it. Yeah. Anyway, let's go down to the next. A and C. What's repentance? A feeling of sorrow? Is it just a feeling of sorrow? Sincere, how do we define sincere sorrow, somebody said? True sorrow. Like, being sorry and meaning it. Right? Okay. How do you know when you, somebody means it? They don't do it again. They don't do it again. That's a very important point. Can you see how what man does compared to what God does is going to be totally different with this subject? In between there, there's something that we need to know about. And for those of you who haven't heard it before, it's called the law, which is not a very bright thing. It's called the law of compensation. Now, some have heard, it, heard me talk about that a bit. It's what you sow, you reap. Does that make sense? That's the law of compensation. Now, God created this law. The reason why God creates laws is laws are the only way to actually keep the universe in harmony with love. So all of God's laws are harmonious with love. And God created every law harmonious with love. And the law of compensation is a great law that he created harmonious with love that affects the soul. In other words, it's a soul-based law. It's a law that affects your soul. Every soul on earth is, and in the spirit world is affected by this law called the law of compensation. And the law of compensation is simply whatever you create, right, you will experience a penalty for its creation in your soul if it's disharmonious with love. In other words, what you sow, you reap. Now, 
why I bring that up is because if a person actually, like in Gary's case, for instance, these these ministers who are administering so-called punishment upon children, beating Gary every second day for whatever he was supposedly have done wrong as a child. Yeah, I didn't know the Yeah, okay. 150 questions and So he didn't learn his catechism and there was a, there was a, a belt in every day or every second day for it. A cane. Like, sounds a bit like torture to me, but doesn't it to you? And it's exactly what it felt like to Gary. So these men, and they in, many of them did enjoy the process of administering this punishment right, upon Gary because he can remember their faces as they were doing it. And he could feel that joy that they got out of it. Now these men were acting in disharmony with love. Now every single thing that happened to Gary, every belting he got and the pain that that caused him, will be a pain that they experience. Now you imagine that. If you've belted like 500 children over the course of your life with a cane, you are going to have to experience, under this law of compensation, your soul will experience the exact pain that you administered on yourself. You will feel it. I had, I, I had a question around that when I heard you speak that, and the example at the time was Hitler. Now, both my parents lived under German occupation, and that's left a trauma on me. Does Hitler feel that also? So, when does it stop for him? When it's all finished? Wow. But hang on a sec, there's another law, see? <laughs> this is why I want to talk about this subject. The truth is, without the laws of divine love, Hitler would continue feeling the law of compensation. Every single event and, and experience, that every pain that every single person has ever felt that occurred because of his choices. And by the way, not all of them occurred because of his choices. Many of them occurred because of the choices of all those around him. Right? But every single thing is attributed to the full choice from God's perspective and the law of compensation you will have to experience. <coughs> You will experience the pain of it. This is the law of compensation. Who's scared? It's a, well, you think about that in your own life. You think about it. every single time you treated your child in a way that caused an emotion within them of pain, you are going to have to feel that pain. You think about that. That's pretty big, isn't it? Even if it's a discipline thing. <laughs> Especially if it's a discipline thing. No, no. Yes. No, no, I don't mean physical. I mean, you know, if you yes, stop doing Yes, there's many things. discipline forms that are not harmonious with love that are certainly going to have to be experienced by you or somebody who's had a child who have administered these unloving discipline forms on their children, which God would never administer, by the way. Is that only on the natural love path? This is, this is a natural love, and this is a general principle of the soul, a soul law, a soul law based around the soul, and it's going to happen. And whether you believe me or not right now, when you pass, you will start feeling this law if you don't believe me now. I can guarantee you, every single spirit who's here today has felt the effects of this law once they've passed in particular. No. Is that, uh, does that tie in with karma? Or is it yes, so very much so. It's the same law. Well, uh, well um, it's more to do with uh, it's what you sow, you reap. But yeah, because there are other laws revolving, revolving around cause and effect. But sure, the law of compensation is a cause and effect based law. Yep. Does that include animals as well? Anything you've done to animals? Yeah. Yep. And therefore, if you've eaten meat? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Short what do you do with innocence? What do you do with what's perpetuated upon you? is done in innocence. How do you understand the law of attraction when you come into the womb and it starts from that point? True, but all of the things that are... See, God knows, God's laws are, are perfect. God knows exactly right, when something has been attributed to you, when it's been attributed to your parents' choices or their parents' choices 
or Adam and Eve, if we can call them that, choices. Whoever, God knows exactly all the choices that have ever been made. All of his laws operate this way. Every single thing cannot be get got away with. In the Paget messages, we said to James Paget, the laws of God on the law of compensation grind so finely that nothing escapes them. Now, don't get all down about this. <laughs> can I just clarify something? There's a lot Sorry. of spirits that are getting... Sorry. Like, I don't know if you can feel your feelings now, yeah. but you can feel them going... Oh. Oh. Can you feel that? Yes. And a lot of the spirits with us are doing the same thing, by the way. Are there many spirits listening to us? Yeah, there's, a lot, there's hundreds of thousands at the moment. And a lot of them are actually going the same, doing the same thing. They're feeling, oh no, oh no, oh no. Like feeling this terrible fear. Please don't leave the conversation because there's more that I want to describe. Right? I want you to understand, though, this law of compensation. Oh, can I just, I just something I'm not understanding and I just want to clarify yep, fire away. maybe I'm in my head or whatever but when yep. I was talking about discipline yep. if, if a child feels pain or anger or hurt because mm. you've said they can't do something which you believe is bad for them or would be harmful mm -hmm. is that the sort of thing? Yep. You have to compensate for that. So I still have, even if it's in their best interest and because you love them? What causes you to think it's in their best interest? Mm -hmm. Was it God's interest for them? Well if they wanted to go out when they were in the teenager and get on the booze and all that sort of thing, would that be in their best interest? Did God stop them from doing it? Well, I'm, I was his mother. I'm no, but did God stop them from doing it? Well, maybe God used me to stop them doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because it wasn't good for them. No, you made the choice. You made a choice out of harmony with their free will. They have the free will to make that choice. You made a choice out of harmony. Even when they make the choice when they're not old enough to understand things. I don't believe I just said that. What was I just saying? <laughs> what are I saying? We all need to become childlike. What does that mean? When your children are two or three years old, they are at the most pristine state that you could even imagine. What makes you think that you know better than them? Honestly. Well, some kids at 14 think they're adults. <laughs> but only because of all the damage we've dumped on them between 3 and 14. Right? So, you know, we've got to get real about this stuff with children. The truth is that every time, every time I break a law of free will, I am breaking a law of love. Every single time I do that, I am going to have to compensate for that. Now, can you see why a lot of people pass in the spirit world and they realise, wow, I didn't know that. What about your intention and what about your understanding? You know, oh, like, my I had some Catholic you? spirits, and I'm not denigrating the Catholic religion here on earth. I had some Catholic spirits come to me. We sat down and had a chat, if you could call it that. They told me that they're going to do everything they possibly can to kill me. Now, they're doing it with really good intentions. I actually asked them what their intention was. They believe their intentions were pure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your intentions part of your belief system then? Is that what you're saying? And it matters not. These, the law of compensation is God's law, not yours. It's not what you think was right. It's what God knows is right. That's what it operates on. Not what you think is right. So then for me, what that tells me is that repentance is as powerful as feeling your emotions. It's absolutely necessary. Because I want to get to the, back to this, yeah. You can't it, underestimate how much you might have done. Definitely not. The majority of us have done far more than what we estimate. <laughs> because, remember, it's from God's perspective, not yours. Does that make sense? It's from God's perspective we're talking about, not yours. If we want to be at one with God, we will in the end have God's perspective, not our own. So the argument then becomes like, so the argument then becomes, I wasn't aware of this law of compensation, so while I'm not aware of it, anything that I did with it, I won't have to pay for. Well, if it's not the moral wrong, you just didn't know it was wrong. 
I understand what you're saying. You're basically saying ignorance is bliss. Yeah. And I'm telling you it's not. It is not bliss. Ignorance is not bliss. You will find when you pass into the spirit world, many things that you were ignorant of doing here on earth, that you thought was fine, that you thought were fine, and you thought you did with the best of intentions, you will find that actually you are wrong. So you're saying if you want to walk this earth, it has to have repentance. No, no. I'm saying this is the law of compensation. I'm, I'm raising the law of compensation not, it's not with the repentance. They're, they are linked together, and I'm going to demonstrate to you what the linkage is. All right? It's very important that you understand what the law of compensation is, though. Can you see how fine the law of compensation is? It's very important you understand that. And for all of our spirit friends here, it's very important that all of you understand that. Because the law of compensation is what's driving your current suffering. So all of, there's lots and lots of spirits here who are in suffering. And the reason why they're in suffering is because the, the law of compensation is the law that's driving that. There is a feeling in their soul, and while they retain that feeling in their soul, the law of compensation will act upon it, and it will continuously bring to their consciousness, through pain, the results of their actions. So is that what the hells are? Is that just an That's extreme That's what the hells form? are. That's what the hells are. The what are? Hey, there's this morning, I, I turned up, and I was as happy as anything. As soon as I sat in this room, I've been going down really yeah. quick. Good. <laughs> and I knew what it was all about. Yeah. Uh, this morning, my um, two and a half year old granddaughter went to do something, and I threatened her. Yeah. So badly. Yep. Yeah. And I know it was just a reaction that I had learned from my parents. Yep. Yeah. And when it was break time I went out and I said I'm going to angry with my parents and I haven't been able to sort of feel the emotion until you just said that. That's it. And I just, I just felt so bad. Alright, now where you're at right now is a state of repentance. Because you never want to do this again, do you? <coughs> can, can, does everyone see like that's a state of repentance? state of repentance, you are full of remorse and you're crying and you feel the direct results of what you've done. That's the state of repentance. Now, what I don't, like the mood is getting depressingly, depressingly. <laughs> but it's very important that you understand what it would feel like being a spirit under this law. Can you feel that? It would feel pretty bad, wouldn't it? Being a person who's past, not even aware of the things that you've done that were damaging. Every single thing you've done that was damaging in your life, you weren't even aware of it. And now you're paying the penalty, or you're paying, you're reaping what you sowed, and you're not even conscious of it. Imagine being in that place. How hard that would be. <laughs> the truth is that this law is already operating on you. You just become more sensitive to it when you become a spirit. And the reason why is here on earth you have one big thing that is, that is something that keeps you away from you with your emotions. And you know what that is? You can manufacture your environment how you want it to be even if it doesn't match your soul condition. In the spirit world, you cannot do that. What do you mean by that? Exactly? Here on earth, I can I can be like a really a murderous, thieving person, stealing from everybody, and I can go and build from my funds that I stole from everybody, a nice two-story mansion sitting on the hill, live in my luxury, lay down at my pool, and marvel at the stupidity of the rest of the world, and get a, and seemingly get away with it. That's what I can do. Right. But the minute I pass, you know where I'll be? <laughs> I'll be in one of the darkest places of the spirit world, not being able to sit by my pool, and I will live in a hovel that stinks, right? and I will wonder, how did I get here? And that will be the start of the process of my law of compensation 
But in reality, if I could look at my soul in the mirror right now, I would already see that it's already in that place. I would already see the disfiguring in my spirit body. I would see this terrible... All I need to do is go along to a medium and say, can you project at me exactly what I look like right now? Right? And they tell you, you actually look like you're dead. They, to a person like that, they would look like they're dead. They would have these sunken eyes, sunken... like the whole... They would be barely recognisable as a human. And in the spirit world, there are many millions of spirits who are barely recognisable as a human. Because of... Scary. And it's, it's a very important truth to understand. And I'm not trying to frighten you. I'm trying to bring you to reality. <laughs> this is the reality of the universe that we live in. God does not allow any breaking of a law of love without there being a consequence. Because God made perfect system. And you might believe it's not perfect right now, but when you pass, you will see the perfection of the entire system. Ajay, how does that sit when we talk about a child, and you're protecting that child from something that possibly cause them death? And they, they try, like, climbing a bill fence or something like that. Can you so, see straight away my idea I'm going to protect them from causing death yeah. is straight away in disharmony with love. Because, because in reality, can anything cause them death? In reality, they are alive no matter what happens and where they go. So, so already my own belief of error, which is that you die and I'm going to lose you, has already imposed an error upon my child and my, upon my choices. So does that mean just that the child can't attack? Yeah. The truth is, Though, that once you've released all of your emotions, you'll find that your child will have hardly any emotions if, and if it's all, you've released all of yours, your child will automatically make automatic decisions in harmony with their soul and they won't want to climb a fence that's dangerous for them. That's how it works, actually. What if somebody's abusing a child and stop it? If someone's abusing the child, the, the child will not even be abused if you had released the emotion within yourself about that. Do you follow me? Because they're under the, the umbrella of protection of you from a spiritual and, so, and, and soul based point of view. If you release all of your emotion of abuse within you, your child will never be abused. Grandchildren do? Sorry? Grandchildren do? Not necessarily, because they are very dependent on their own parents as to what protection they receive. But we can clear our kids. Certainly. With our clearing. It doesn't mean, well, it depends on their age. We've talked about that before too, and I've got a long discussion about children as a separate issue. But when it, the discussion that I have about children, you all find very confronting. Because we don't realise that actually every single action that our children take is based upon our emotional error that's sitting within us, or our emotional truth for that matter. It just depends. They are completely reflecting to you what you have unhealed in yourself. Every action, everything they choose to do. You, you can test this. All you need to do is release one causal emotion and notice the effect on your child no matter what age. You will see your child change. My son's 34 and lives in Hong Kong and he's changing. Because you're changing. And he's talking to me lots about his emotions and everything that's going on in his life. Yeah. And when did that really begin? This communication about emotions and everything. It's been the last couple of months since I've been watching the DVD. <laughs> so, since you've been dealing with your emotions. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Does that make sense? Yes. Any age, this is, by the way. Um, I'm getting off the subject yeah. again. Yeah. I want to have a whole chat about children, but I want you to bring your children to that chat. Because what I'm going to do in that chat is I'm going to invite your children to come up with me and tell you about how they really feel about you. <laughs> without judgment and without anger. Without... And then we'll work through the law of, you know, the different cause and effect emotions that are going through. You could be very lonely in that. Does anyone want to come to that chat? <laughs> Well, it's very difficult why you have emotion or error within yourself to see what God sees. Okay, so 
What do you the do? law of compensation and repentance, if there's a limitation to our vision of Well, let's talk more see. about the interaction between these laws. Yes. Is it, there is actually a law of repentance. There is a law of forgiveness, a law of repentance. There is a law of compensation. I wanted to mention the law of compensation because it's important you understand this is part of the universe you live under. Uh, this law is a law that is an essential part of the universe. It's an essential part of God keeping God's universe in order. Right? Thank you. Sorry. Yep. I just wanted to finish that question that um, I've been asked about the child coming over the fence. Yep. If it is your truth that you believe that you don't want your child to climb the fence because they might run out, if you didn't follow that... But can't you see straight away that's a fear belief? And didn't we establish a long time ago in our discussions that fear is not harmonious with love? But if that's where I am... Well, if that's where you are, you can impose that law if you wish, but you're breaking God's law doing it. So if I, if I am at that state and I don't follow that, that just let the child climb the fence, as a choice between that and... Um, um, not living in my truth, whatever is an error, mm -hmm. or... Whose truth are we trying to live in, though? <coughs> See, truth. didn't I say right at the start when I did the very first presentation, I said, all of you feel that living in your truth is the important mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. But what's actually important? Your if you want to be at one with God. Yes, but, but AJ, don't we have to first... Isn't that what we're... To our own truth. Feel it, sure, but don't act upon it because it's going to often be an error. Like, I'll, I'll often feel like through my progression of murdering somebody, does that mean I go ahead and do it? Doesn't it? But if you don't act responsibly with that little child who's going to climb the fence, that. But it's got to be God's definition of responsible. What's God's definition of responsible? God's definition of responsible is I teach my child all of God's laws. But there's a sense of ultimate good here. How, how can it be it? ultimately good? I know you're all having trouble. <laughs> <laughs> how, how can it be ultimately good if you're breaking a law of free will? Yeah, but it's not good to let the little kids go on the fence and drown. But the child won't drown. The child won't drown. Is it how you do it, though? Like, you can pick, pick the child up and come on, little fella, you don't need to do that and be in a space of love. No, I'm sorry, I have to disagree with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my answer to that question is that there's a difference between the all the time I'm not in God's truth, I'm going to protect my child. And as soon as I'm in God's truth, I don't need to. Yeah. Totally. But that's now then excusing you being not in God's no, truth. No, I'll, I'll suffer the consequences. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there will be consequences. I'm glad you want to suffer them. <laughs> Very. Okay. Does it, like... <clears throat> Honestly, the discussion about children is really going to—it's going to be pretty confronting, isn't it? Just from this discussion. And the truth is that every single time you break a law of love, and the law of love involves the law of free will, very much so. Every single time you break a law of love, there is a compensatory effect upon your soul, and you will feel the pain of it at some point in the future. And I am suggesting to you to let yourself go through another process, which I haven't fully explained at this point. <laughs> right. Is this, uh, this is the good news coming? Yeah. yeah, the good news is coming. This is why I called it in the first century the good news of the kingdom. <coughs> You heard that statement, right? Yeah. Sounds pretty religious, I think. But it's the good news of what is an alternative to this law of compensation. But I want you to first understand the law of compensation. Because if you don't understand the law of compensation, you're not going to understand the good news of this other law, are you? Can you see that? Yeah. That on, 
but these God's truth. Is the law of compensation greater then than if we had just not known it and been drinking? Yes. And is that just because it's, it's, it hurts our soul more? Not just that, it's because you've made a choice to ignore the truth. And make, choosing to ignore the truth does have, a con does have an effect on your soul. That also applies in the, the choosing the divine love path. It implies in every single thing, every single thing you do in your life. Actually, it stops you in your track. Like you won't go home and want to be together because you'll go. Oh no, that just doesn't feel right. Exactly. Yeah. You, start getting yeah. you make changes. Yeah. See, see, see. You, how many times do you think a murderer would stop and pause if he knew right from the time he was a little child, he knew that every single act of murder would result in him feeling the pain that he is inflicting upon every single person that he did, and their families and everything else. If he knew that, right from the moment, you know, a few years after he was born, do you think he'd think about murdering very much? No. Well, same know? with suicide. Same with suicide, same with other things, right? If we knew the truth, if we only knew the truth, a lot of times we wouldn't do the same things, right? So don't look at knowing the truth as a bad thing. See. The trouble is when I have this presentation about the law of compensation, which I have a whole discussion on, the law of compensation, but a lot of times when I have that discussion, everybody goes into, oh no, we don't want to know any more truth. <laughs> <laughs> Why would we want to know more truth? We're just going to get hurt more. But that's not true, actually. If you know more truth, what's the automatic response in your soul? Is you start acting in harmony with truth, which means more happiness, not, you know? So we need to look at things positive. Hey, Jake. Could I, I'd like to share something, if, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I had a very dominant, controlling mother, yeah. and I realised in my later life it was because she was afraid she was going to lose us, and I was that way with my children. Yep. And I had a death experience. I was clinically dead for three minutes when I was about 37. Yep. And I experienced this incredible love, and I'd had a premonition I was going to die. Yep and I tried to make arrangements for the children and I knew in that experience that they were loved far more than I could ever imagine loving them and that it didn't matter what happened to me that they would always be loved and cared for yeah. and I didn't realise, I realised to a pretty big extent but not completely until this minute yeah. just what that meant. That was. I did let yeah. them go a lot but not yeah. Completely. So what, what you experienced in that moment was the fact that God actually loves your children far yeah. more than you could ever consider even loving yes. them. E ever, by the way. It was in incredible, your entire... incredible love. Yeah. Yes. And even in your entire experience and your entire progression, God loves every one of his children more than that. Oh. You will never, ever, ever be able to love another person as God loves you. <coughs> in your entire existence. So why are you worried? about what they will do, what they will what will happen to them. Right? Can you see that all of these worries come from fears and they all come from error and they all come from emotions that were just inculcated on us generation after generation after generation after generation. And this is what we're dealing with. We're trying to get rid of all these, aren't we? So it's really important to understand some of these you know, clear facts about truth. Yeah. So Law of compensation. Does everyone understand it a bit better now? Yes. Good. Now, why have I raised the law of compensation? Because without the laws of divine love, you and every single person who's ever, ever lived in a physical sense, when they pass, and even before they pass, in fact, the moment they create every event, straight from that moment, the law of compensation places a penalty upon the soul for any event that's out of harmony with love. And that's applying to every single person who has ever lived on this earth. Now, you imagine for a moment what that means. Because it's very important you imagine what it means before I can show you how beautiful this other law is that God's created. 
You follow me? We need to see sometimes the contrast before we understand. This other law that God created is the law of grace or the law of mercy, which is related to his laws of divine love. And the laws of divine love are higher than the laws of natural love. The law of compensation is a law of natural love. And what do I mean by that? Well, just like the law of gravity is a lower law than the law of aerodynamics, so too the law of repentance, forgiveness and mercy, which is all the laws of divine love, are higher laws than the law of cause and effect or the law of karma. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So, when we enter this state, we activate a part of God's soul. When we enter that state, <coughs> when we activate a part of God's soul in that state, it draws from God this. <coughs> Grace. When we enter a state of <coughs> repentance it, and we direct that repentance towards God, it activates a part of God's soul where God's mercy or grace, it's actually God's love, God's divine love, actually enters our soul and takes away from our soul the cause of why we did that thing. Now, in taking away the cause, there's no law of compensation anymore that can act upon it. So it's like the law of compensation doesn't exist. And there's a penny dropping. Yeah. Does that mean, in like Hitler's example, that if he was to truly feel that repentance, the pain that we might feel around his actions would be ours to resolve and not his? Yeah. And this applies to everyone. This applies to you too. Like, this, this is a universal law that God created. That any pain that you've created another in another person, as long as you enter a state of repentance, then God can actually enter into you through the love. The love can enter you. It will enter you. You'll feel it entering. What was the lady's name sitting next to you? Jean. Jean. She was feeling God's love entering her while she was crying in that state of and repentance. And you could feel that happening, right? Yeah. Yep, that's right. And m many of you, some of you are already starting to feel it now, right? Where you're starting to feel this connection with God more greatly. What's happening is this feeling of repentance, true heartfelt sorrow. So I want to define repentance. True heartfelt sorrow and remorse and a desire to never do it again. Right? is what I would classify as repentance. Now that actually means you softening up and actually feeling the full effects and being prepared to feel the full effects of what you've done. Now that requires bravery, doesn't it? But once you enter that state and you direct that state to God, God's love can now come into you and actually remove from you the cause or reason why you did it. Does it help the person you did it to? Totally. <laughs> yep. Sorry? So you will if you, if this actually happens to you, you will never do that same thing again. Ever. In your entire existence. You will never do that same thing again. Whatever that was. Hey Jay, it sounds like um, that's what the confessional system is set up for. And what happened with the confessional system is they got a lot of the teachings that I taught, turned them all into intellectual beliefs and then tried to make it work in a, in a physical way. 
But the truth is, there is this law that does actually operate upon your soul. And every spirit here it applies to as well as any person on earth. And this law is activated by this act on your behalf. This act of repentance. See, God has already forgiven you. God doesn't need to forgive you. Because God's already forgiven everything you've done. But what actually, at that point, you are still governed by the law of compensation. God's forgiven you, but until you enter this state, there is no mercy that can be shown. When I say mercy, what I mean by that, or grace, what I mean by that is that somebody can't take the causal away from you, causal emotion away from you. Let's apply this to some physical interactions, just so that we get the idea. Let's say somebody comes up and punches you in the arm today <coughs> and walks off. What's your feelings? Ouch. Ouch might be your feeling. The first day. So, ouch. What? Why did I do that for? <laughs> Bit of shock, right? Oh, that was out of the blue. Look at the law of compensation. Look at the law of attraction. <laughs> Whatever happened there, I don't know. But, you know, my arm hurts. Next day, the same person walks past you and gives you another wallop in the arm. What are you now feeling? You know, you start to feel like, whoa, what's going on here now? Like, this is not... Aren't you? You're starting to feel some feelings about, you know, that it's maybe more than just an accident <laughs> or a bad day. By the third day, what's happening? Oh, we did. He gives you another whack in the arm. What was the answer then? Yeah, the third day you're taking a baseball bat along. <laughs> this is how we operate, often, isn't it? All right. In that entire process, what's happening is that we are getting into a state, aren't we, where there's an emotion being triggered inside of us. And we're wanting to respond in kind. We want to respond in a way that... Uh, this, this is how wars begin, is it not? Yeah. Exactly how wars begin. Exactly this. So, what happens though, is God has already forgiven that man for, for, for punching him. And he's, God's already forgiven you for your reaction as well. No. But what's actually happening in the souls of the both of you? He is having this penalty effect upon his soul for acting in an unloving manner. And your anger, which is being triggered by some causal emotion in you, inside of you, yeah? Because if you're in a state of one with God, do you think you'd want to punch him back? No, you'd say, <laughs> the truth is you wouldn't even probably even feel that track. Why is that? Because you're in a state of one with God, and in a state of one with God there is no fear, there's only love. And when you're in a state of love, those kind of reactions will not happen to you. You will not react angrily. You're only reacting angrily because you're in denial of a deeper emotion within you that actually created the event, right? <laughs> Hi, <laughs> Jeff. You didn't feel it very much if you were at one of the body suffer a bit less because of the law of conversation. No. You have to feel it <laughs> no, he, he will suffer because the law is the same in the same, the same circumstances. God's laws are constant, constant, constant. But he didn't cause you that much pain. Immaterial. He wouldn't have been attractive. Immaterial. It's, it, the, the actual law of compensation acts upon the sole condition that created the event, not the event itself. Does everyone understand that? Sorry? Do you mean the intention? Yeah, it acts upon the soul's emotion that created the condition that created the event. The law of compensation is what act, it's the soul's condition that it acts upon, not the actual event. Alright, so... These things are happening to us on a daily basis, right? Where we're getting hurt, seemingly, from other people all the time, and so we react to those events, right? Don't we? Right. When we enter a state of forgiveness, what that will mean is I will feel my emotion completely about getting punched three times in a row. I will feel all the hurt. I will feel all the underlying hurt. I will feel the causal hurt that actually caused this man to come and punch me and not the next person. 
And once I feel all of that, I will be in a state of forgiveness with that man. Does that make sense? I am now in a state of forgiveness with that man once I've released all that emotion. Now, is he sorry for what he's done? Well, not yet. He hasn't demonstrated. And so if there's a high likelihood what's going to happen tomorrow. He's going to come along and punch me in the arm again. What will I feel this time? Nothing. Like an idiot for going home again. Yes. Yes, that's the only thing I will feel. And the reason why is because I have not recognized the importance of this. You see, why enter interactions with people if the person isn't sorry for their previous actions? You follow me? Because if they're not sorry for their previous actions and you enter into an interaction with them, what will happen? The same thing again. So, so I can forgive them and I can love them, but until they are there, it's impossible for me to go there and say, I want to spend time with you again. Do you follow me? That's in our day-to-day -day life. So let's look at this from God's perspective now. From God's perspective, God forgives every single thing you have ever done and I have ever done. God forgives it automatically. The time it happened, He forgives it even before it happened. He knows it's going to happen. He knows everything, right? Now, the next thing, thing is, I get into this state now of repentance or not. It just depends. If I'm not in this state of repentance, the law of compensation has its immediate effect on my soul, like a brand on my soul. And if I don't notice it now, and we're so desensitized to our spirit form, and we're so desensitized to our own pain and suffering, usually on earth, that we don't notice it. I will notice it when I pass. And many of the spirits here are noticing it completely, full on, complete experiences for them. I can now go through this process of forgiveness, examining the things that I have actually done, and feeling the emotion of it, and I can start forgiving myself, and in the process of that, I will become repentant and remorseful of the things that I've done. And that is what draws God to you in that state. Why? Because you are now recognizing what you did disharmonious with love. And God feels that's beautiful. That's beautiful when you see that. In yourself, when you see what you've done and you're humble enough to allow the experience of what you've done towards yourself, and you're humble enough to experience that, that's a beautiful state from God's perspective. And from that moment, from that moment, and you long to go for love, God's love will enter you, and it has a space now to enter you. You see, when you're, when you're not sorry, when you're not repentant, when you don't want to ever do it again, and you're happy to do it again, what happens is you are actually putting up your hand to love and you're saying, no, no, I don't want love. I want to do what I want to do. Right? And I'm not, you know, this is how we are, isn't it, sometimes? I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to listen to you or anybody else. And so what we're actually doing in that state is we are rejecting any softening of our own heart and we, we are rejecting love from entering our soul. We're stopping divine love from entering us. Yes. Hey, do we actually, or are we able to remember all of these, these, these actions? Yeah, your soul has a, is a complete record of every single thing you have ever done to harm another. But are they, are they, what, is it, again, is it just an individual <coughs> item on each of them, like the law of conversation? So, is there repentance in your way? Um, well, you, yes, you will. <laughs> it's, it's, it's bluntly, yes. But you don't have to pay the penalty in full now because God's love has entered you and taken the emotion out. Do you follow me? So instead of paying years and years and years and years, and there's many spirits here in the spirit world who have been there for 2,000 years paying these penalties, by the way. Right? I have spirits who, who were involved in my murder in the first century who are still in the hills paying for these experiences because they don't want to do this. That's the only thing stopping them from progressing. They don't want to do that. They don't want to actually be sorry. 
that's the only thing that's stopping them. They could be in the celestial heavens by now. Many of you met Cornelius, right? Some yes. of you met Cornelius, yeah? Cornelius nailed me to the stake, right? <coughs> and in that moment of seeing and us connecting emotionally, as he described, he just threw down the hammer, walked away, and he went from that moment on through a state of repentance. He had many things to work through. It took him 50 years in the spirit world to work through those things. He murdered thousands upon thousands of people. He raped hundreds of women in his life. Right? And he worked through all of those things in a few years because of being willing to be repentant for every act. Does that make sense to you? You can call that Cornelius uh, law. <laughs> yeah, but the law existed long before Canadian. <laughs> um, uh, what guilt and self-rejection? That doesn't. That's not. No, I'm not talking about guilt here. Guilt is a totally different emotion, and guilt. Some guilt is appropriate, in the sense that when we're in a space of repentance, we feel guilty, right, about things we actually have done. But many times your guilt is inappropriate because it's guilt others have dumped on you. And many times you feel guilty for things that are not disharmonious with love. Right? Many times you actually feel guilty about doing things harmonious with love. For example, how many of you feel guilty when you tell someone the truth and they cry? Quite a lot, right? You just did something harmonious with love and you feel it's guilty. You know? Obviously, obviously you don't need to feel that guilt, do you? But we do because of the projection of emotion and the emotional baggage in us. Is it just the physical that we have to um, feel repentance? Because verbally, people can. Feel yeah, this is not. This is not, by the way, a verbal act. Yeah. It's not a, even an action, although it may involve actions. So it's not repentance. Is not those things. Right? Repentance is a feeling in your soul. You can't manufacture it. It's going to have to be real for it to work. Okay, it seems to me that um, the law of compensation is like an involuntary experience of pain that you cause others. Repentance is an involuntary Exactly. Exactly. Say that again. She said that the law of compensation is an involuntary uh, experiencing of the pain that you've caused others. But the law of repentance is a voluntary experiencing of the pain you've caused others. And that clears the first one. And it clears the effects of the first law. No. That's the beauty of this law. Like, you don't have to always be aware of the cause, although sometimes the cause is directly involved in the action. And then, of course, you will have to be. But sometimes you won't be aware of the cause. Some of the causes are within you that came within you when you were two years of age from somebody. Like, you're not going to be necessarily intellectually aware of that cause, are you? But if you're willing to be sorry for your action and experience complete repentance, and pray to God, ask God through your longings, remember that's what prayer is, ask God through your longings for that love to enter you and remove this cause, you'll find that cause, even though you're not conscious of what it was, will be removed from you, and you will not be able to do that thing ever again. You will never do it again. Is there, is there a chance that you, you can actually have a block of similar causes removed when you, know, you repeatedly through a long life, did the same thing again and again and again. Uh, yes, so because they all may have come from the same cause. Yes. Yeah, <coughs> certainly. But the, the, in practice, how this works for many spirits is, like all of you have heard of Nero, right? Emperor Nero? Yeah. Yes, yeah, he's a friend of mine in the spirit world. Right? Now, he, he, when he was on earth, was very, very damaged emotionally. And he caused huge amounts of damage to people around him. His own soulmate he murdered. Um, just huge amounts of damage. Now, he spent nearly uh, over 
pretty close to 2,000 years in a state in the hills with the law of compensation not getting anywhere. He, he, he could write volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of his experiences in the hills that was, that was so negatively depressing that you'd walk away and want to murder yourself <laughs> just hearing about them, right? That he actually lived through himself, experiencing the law of compensation. Once he had an awakening to this other law, which actually his soulmate helped him have, he progressed and now he's in the spirit in the in the celestial spheres. And that happened I think in less than two hundred years. Yeah. With and considering all the things he did, we're talking about he would have stayed with, without his soulmate's help on this law, he would have stayed in his state for probably ten thousand years or more. You know, maybe even longer. There's ones in the spirit world who have stayed that long. So um, what did the soulmate actually do for him to help him to get to that point? She loved him. With all of it, he looked ugly, he looked like disgusting, and he went through, he got to this place, and she was waiting for this place, he got to this place of, where he cried out to God. Physically cried out. Yeah, driven by his emotion. And the whole description of the event, by the way, is in the pageant messages, if you'd like to read it. And my suggestion is to read it, it's a really moving example of the law of compensation versus the law of, of forgiveness and mercy but it's also a very moving example about soulmates as well it's a lovely lovely experience i'd like to see a movie made out of it actually i should mention that we've got uh 40 copies of the uh, cd rom yep. um over in the cupboard there for people who haven't actually received that yet no worries. That, yep. that we can give to them uh, free of charge no worries. <coughs> so just do a search on there when you open one of the pageant messages, I think it's in book three, TG3 or what it's called, open that, do a search for Nero, and you'll find his experience there. My suggestion is have a read of it. Um, does everyone start, is everyone starting to deal with what this is about? Yeah. Right? Can you see its importance yeah. in your life? It's a very, very important principle yeah. in your life, if you want to progress on the line like that. So, it's not about verbal, sorry, oh, I'm sorry. What do we teach our children? Go and say you're sorry. Yeah. Oh, I have to. Like, yeah, go and say you're sorry. You're not getting tea until you say sorry. Oh, okay, so they go off and say they're sorry. Are they sorry? No. Oh, it's just words. It's just words. Like, if we're teaching our children that, it's not the law of, you know, that's not the law of repentance. Um, when someone feels hurt by something we've done, does that necessarily mean that God also sees us to no, some penalty? No, definitely not. Why? Exactly. What me might have been done might have been loving, but they've interpreted it as unloving. Example? Telling them the truth. Telling them the truth. <laughs> exactly. Like how many people don't want to hear the truth? Lots. And how many times? How do they respond to hearing the truth? Angry, Angry sad, grief. All sorts of things, right? But then there's never ever, or any reason why you would perpetuate hurt on another person. Uh, getting back to Graham's mention. It's, it's related. Yeah, it's related. If, when you say perpetuate hurt, let's look at that from God's perspective. If you're telling the truth and the other person's hurting, it's not because you're telling the truth. You aren't perpetuating that. It's the so error. Say something hurtful to another person. Is there any really good reason to do that? Uh, when you say you say something hurtful to the other person, let's define hurtful. Define hurtful as would God find this hurtful? Does God find telling the truth hurtful? Does God find telling the truth with an intention to harm somebody hurtful? Yes. Okay. So if I'm telling the truth with intention to harm them, what's my intention? Is it loving or unloving? Unloving. So will I pay a penalty for that? Yes. Until I'm and never want to do it again. <coughs> yep. And in the first century I said if, if out of the heart's abundance the mouth speaks, right? Out of the heart's abundance the mouth speaks. What, what did I mean by that? I mean, everything you say, every action you take, is based on what's in your heart, what's in your emotions. 
That's what's speaking, really. Right? And that's what we need to change. Isn't that what the Divine Love Path is all about? Changing what's in your emotions so that your emotions are harmonious with God's emotions. And then you are at one with God. Now, some of you be religious, yeah? You've had a, a, a religious but Christian upbringing? Yeah. Who's heard of the Lord, the, the uh, sermon of the prodigal son? Yeah. Who's heard of that? Yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> I've told it so many times. It's so <laughs> Tell me about it. Well, the prodigal son was the heir to the estate. He wanted his inheritance so that he which he went and squandered on women and wine and song and not all that. Good eye. And uh, then when he had it all spent, he found he was hungry. There was a famine in that country and he was glad to eat the husks from the grain and everything else. You're dead right, yeah. So let me, not, not many people are hearing you, so let me, let me describe. And in fact, I've bought a Bible. That's triggering for a quote. I'd like to probably read it to you, but let me describe it to you. There was a man who had two sons. He had an elder son, and he's, the elder son was always loving and considerate of this man. The elder son was always trying to do and trying to please the man. And he had a younger son. And the younger son was a bit wayward. He would <coughs> often go off and do things. And, uh, you know, that his father often at times felt sad about. It. And his father would uh, talk to him about it, you know, as you would, wouldn't you, if you were a father who loved his child. And you talk to him about he talked to him about the principles involved with what he was doing. But most often the younger son never listened. And so what happened was that uh, when this younger son got to a certain age, he decided that actually his dad had a lot of money. And you know what would happen normally in my time in the first century? The only time you'd ever get any money from your father was when you were the oldest son. When you were the oldest and your no, no, no. dad died. That's the only time you'd ever get any money. So he's the younger son. And he knows his dad loves him. And he knows his dad really cares about him. So his older brother better hurry up and have a son. <laughs> but let's keep on with the story. <laughs> so what he does is he goes to his dad and he says, Dad, I don't want to wait till you die before I work out my older brother's not going to give me any money. What I want to do instead is that you give me my half. Because you've promised me, you, you, I know you treat me like the same as every other, you know, my, the other son, you know. And I know you love me just like him. Can you please give me my half now, before you die? And that'd be pretty hard to take as a father, wouldn't it, don't you think? It'd be pretty hard to take. Imagine. Instead of waiting for you to die to get what he wants from you, he wants to get it now. And he, he's not saying anything about the older son. Imagine how the older son would have felt. How would you have felt if you were the older son? A bit cross. A bit cross. All of this inheritance is yours, isn't it? Yeah. So what's he doing? He's going and taking half of your inheritance and your dad is giving it to him now? That's pretty rough deal, isn't it, don't you think? He's not giving you your inheritance now, is he? No, he's living in the house too, he's not giving it to you. Right. Anyway, the young son goes off. And just as the, our sister here described, he had lived a life of debauchery. Had as many women as he could manage. And uh, drunk himself to oblivion. And one morning, he woke up and he was laying in a pigsty. He was laying with the pigs in a pigsty to keep warm. And he was covered in muck. And he said to himself, if, if I was uh, with my father right now, even if I was just a slave to my father, 
I would be being treated better than what I'm being treated right now. And so he decided to travel home and actually go to his father and ask his father whether he could be his father's slave. So his father comes to him, right? He's walking up the path of his father, and his father comes running down, gives him a big hug, and says, my son has returned. Right? And let's put on a feast. So he gets the older brother to kill one of the older brother's cows that belonged to the older brother. <laughs> and he makes a big feast for the younger son. Why? Because the younger son had come to the point of repentance. And the younger son was willing to go through all the emotions that it was going to mean to be in that place. Be a slave. He was willing to be a slave. Right? And can you see how that encouraged the mercy, if you like, of the father? The father had already forgiven him, had he not? If he hadn't forgiven him, he would have not given him the money in the first place. Just the act of asking for it would have created enough anger in the father to not give it. So he'd already forgiven him. But the son's actions of repentance is what caused the father's heart to be gone, to go out to him. And the father said, you are, you are my son, and you will be treated as my son. Is it not then a blessing that the younger son chose to go the way of rebellion? <laughs> Is it not a blessing because he comes back into an understanding of God in a personal sense through his repentance? And therein lies the greatest gift that you can have that you find God through perhaps the darkness and the darkest of ways and you come back to God and find God in a state with you forever. Yeah. You'd never walk away again, would you? No. Yeah. Can you see how really in a way all of us as mankind are in this state? Yeah. We're all in a state where we've walked away from God, yeah. right? And we've done our own thing, you know? And we still want the same inheritance, <laughs> don't we? We still want bliss, we still want happiness, we still want all of the physical things that God would normally have given us. We're in this state a lot of times where we are not sorry for this state we're in of being self-reliant, wanting to be totally, to dominate our own lives, if you like. When we get into this state, we just change. And what, I'm trying, what I want to encourage you to do today, and over this Christmas period, uh, is to think seriously about this and how this will impact upon your life. To allow yourself to ponder and question these things that have happened in your life that you realise are not harmonious with love. And then allow yourself to experience them emotionally and talk to God about them. Talk to God about what has happened. And let yourself feel them. And then see whether God's love isn't changing you. Because it will. So does everyone understand when mercy is displayed? <laughs> now why can't God show mercy before that time? Because you're not able to receive it? What would you do if you had gone out and murdered and the very next day you could feel this love from God enter you and know that without anything you did, you were automatically in this place now where all of that penalty of the murder has gone? What would you be tempted to do? <laughs> to murder again, wouldn't you? So can you see why God wouldn't allow that to occur? Why there has to be this state of repentance in between before this love can enter us and take away the cause? 
You see that? And also it's about our free will, isn't it? If my free will is that I want to hold on to all of this resistance that's inside of me, and I want to hold on to all this hurt that I've hurt other people that's inside of me, the emotional reasons why I've done it, and I want to hold on to that, if I'm in that place, then how <coughs> can God's love enter me anyway? How can love enter me even? It can't, can it? Until I get to the state where I'm open in my heart to receiving that love. So, you know, in your own progression, you will find that the most difficult emotions that you will have to deal with are the emotions where you have harmed others. You will want to justify yourself. You will want to shift the blame to someone else. You will want to minimize it. You will want to get angry about it. You will want to swear and scream at God and the universe for what is happening to you as a result of it. But when you hit this place, the place of repentance, you won't want to do any of those things anymore. And in the process of not doing those things anymore, you've now just made a huge leap closer to God. And that leap that comes from your own heart's change is going to cause God's heart to resonate with yours. What do you feel when you see your little child sorry for what they've done? And crying right in front of you, sorry for them just kicking somebody, in them, and they're sorry, and they cut to the heart of it. What do you feel? You just want to hug them, don't you? And give them. Why? Do, this is how God feels about us when we enter that state. Exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. He wants to just hug you and take away from you the cause that caused you to do that action. That's how God feels about this issue. And for all of the spirits who have, who, who have been dwelling on this terrible compensatory effects of all of the effects of what they've done on earth, which is what they deserve from a point of, from a point of view of what they've created, this other law can come into action if they soften their heart. And if they soften their heart to the point where they're sorrowful about what's going on. And they soften their heart and they feel that remorse. Once they get into that state, this new law will be activated in their lives. And they will change so rapidly that they will, within a few, very few years, get to the point of what really forgiveness is. And do you know what that is? When we are forgiven, really, we get to this point. <coughs> Where we've forgot. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that emotionally, inside of you, you'll get to the place where you'll be able to remember every single thing you've done. Every single thing that was damaging that you've done. And you will get to the point where emotionally, it's like you've forgotten them. Because there will no longer be a single emotional signature attached to the remembering of the event. And that at that point, you'll know that you have been forgiven. Mm -hmm. Do you have to be on the divine path to get this mercy? Or you have to be, you can get to the point of forgetting right, on the natural love path, but it takes many hundreds or thousands of years to get to that point. You can get to the point of forgetting in a very short period of time on Divine Love Park. Because remember what I said, the operation of God's love is that when the repentance draws God's heart to you, and the process is it removes the causal emotion within you, so you no longer have to pay the law of compensation effects, right? And you will have forgotten emotionally. Has anybody got stuff outside that they might want to get start to rain? And that means that you are victim of that. It's also in that state for And no, no, everyone who's a forgive victim of that will not be in a state. Automatically where they've forgotten those things. Can it be cleared? They can clear it a lot more easily. But like Cornelius, for example, many of the people that Cornelius harmed in the first century are still in the first sphere of the spirit world. He's told you that, remember? Yeah. Yeah. He said he actually talked to a few of the women that he raped. 
and they are actually still there. Why? Because they can't forgive him. They, why? Because they can't allow themselves to feel the emotion inside of themselves. That's all. That's the only thing that's stopping them. And it's so sad because it's only that one thing, that one thing of being rejecting their own emotion that's preventing them from being in his state. That's all. That one thing. Because when you when you're working through issues with your children, your children's actions and many of their emotions are a direct reflection of what you're denying in yourself, right? Because of their proximity to you and their closeness to their pristine condition, that's the result. So so when you work through your own stuff in terms of emotionally yourself you'll find that your children all may automatically feel a release of that burden. Yeah. But they will hold on to some things that they themselves will then need to choose at some point to release. And it's only the choice of holding on that causes us to stop progressing. Does this apply when, if spirits deal with that on that side, does the effect flow on the people in time? Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, if a spirit in the spirit world deals with something that's to do with their children on earth, towards their children on earth, does their child on earth change? And the answer is yes. <coughs> so, but, by the way, the discussion about children is a very unique discussion. <laughs> and we need to have that at some point. It's a very, very interesting thing that goes on. This, <coughs> this is about one of God's divine laws and how it can impact upon your life very, very rapidly. today about being a cycle of fear or a cycle of any emotion that we're not fearing. Um, is it the case that the law of mercy, if you if you stay stuck in it, can come in and remove the cause of the emotion? It depends whether we get into this state or not. See, a lot of times we're in a state of fear and in this cycle because we don't want to face the real emotion. If you really do, if you really... No, see... see don't think you really do, like, see a lot of, and a lot of you are doing this with your own progression, is you're thinking you're really wanting the emotion. But many times the truth is, actually, if you're not experiencing the emotion, you're not really wanting it. And also, above it is a cap or a block that you do not want. So does that make sense? Like, for example, many of you are not experiencing some causal emotions regarding grief, because you have judgment of grief. In other words, you think grief is weak. You think it's powerless. You think it's, you know, people are going to manipulate you and control you when you're feeling it. Right? These are all feelings that are there sometimes, right? So, when we're in that state, what's the thing God is trying to teach us? No, He's saying to you, grief is beautiful. Grief is the healing emotion. You need to change your heart about grief before you're going to feel your grief. And you can pray all your life, and you can long all your life to get to that causal emotion. But if you have judgment about it that you're not releasing, that you're not dealing with, then you'll never get there. Because you're not dealing with the thing that you need to deal with. Many times we do that. The reason I ask is because I feel that when I've experienced a certain emotion for a long period of time, I've had a lot of trouble releasing it. I have felt God's mercy come in and actually it feels like it has been removed. Good. Yeah. So it has. Yeah, so. so trust that. Yeah. And you'll notice your law of attraction change too, by the way, with this. Your law of attraction will change. Like in, in a spirit's case, what happens is when they enter this state of repentance, even their location in the spirit world changes. Mm -hmm. And it changes automatically. And in fact, what happens is they're surrounded by spirits who just lift them up to the new location. This is your new home now. Just going through that emotion, this is your new home. And so what, what is great for a spirit is that they can immediately and instantly see the effect of their repentance. The problem for us here on earth is we don't always immediately and instantly see it. And so therefore we think the law doesn't exist. But, I, but 
you know, if you allow yourself to feel it, you will know that it's happened. You will feel it inside of yourself. You will know it's happened. And you will see it with your law of attraction change. You will see it with your law of attraction change. What about forgiveness of yourself, right? It's the same principle, really. God has already forgiven you. So if you refuse to forgive yourself, you are already in disharmony with God. Does that make sense to everyone? God has already forgiven you. If you refuse to forgive yourself, you are in disharmony with God. Right? The key is to not punish yourself about that. Is to pray about that. Talk to God about, I, I'm in dis I can see I'm disharmony. Like you've already forgiven me and I can't forgive myself. Help me go through these emotions so that I can actually forgive myself. Talk to God about that. Let God take and also pray about, you know, why you can't forgive yourself. And I find myself when I do all of those kind of things, within a few days or if not the same day, usually, I get shown through the laws of attraction and everything what I'm not forgiving in myself and what I need to do. Um, it's like making complex forgiving that we can split and have dissociative Yep. If we're split, it's because part of us is still choosing to not to ignore. And and so in the end, the thing that's only the only thing that's ever going to overcome any disassociative type of disorders is the fact that we're all every single disassociated part of us wants to feel their emotion. When that happens, unification occurs. In other words, unification of your identity occurs. So the key thing is to remember that, in the end, these principles apply whether we're disassociated, split or, or together. In the end, if every single part of us gets into the state of fully experiencing our emotion and getting into the state of repentance about anything that we do that is damaging, it will have the effect on the whole of us anyway. <coughs> My father passed away recently and I'd really like to help him uh, get to the point of feeling like he'd, he'd like to uh, repent for some of his poor choices. What would be the best way that I could uh, assist him? Um, you cannot help another person ever be repentant. Disagreement there? <laughs> <laughs> but you can help them with knowledge. You can help them with knowledge about what's going on. You can help them with, you know, the truth of what they've done. You can tell them the truth about what they've done and how disharmonious with love and how bad it was from, from the point of view of damage that it's been done to others. But you will not ever be able to get and help another person get into a state of repentance themselves. Why? It's a feeling that comes from within them. So Nero's soulmate came after that happened for Nero, not before. If you read the account, Nero, well no, she just said some words of truth. Don't you realise we love you? Don't you realise that every single person you kill in the, you know, in the arenas, every Christian you kill, every one of those ones love you. We don't want to harm you. We don't want to hurt you. Can't you just soften your heart and get into this place? She appealed to his reason to get into that place. And in the end, only he could get into that place. You cannot make a person become repentant. You can only, if you're going to assist them, the only way is by truth. Tell them truth, tell them truth. It's the same way you assist anything, isn't it? Truth, 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 truth. truth. That's the way we do it. Jen. That's my dad too that Peter's talking yeah. about. Can I forgive my dad? Yeah. My dad, God has already too. And my dad's here. That's why Peter brought it up. Yeah. And he's a really good person. And I really loved him all my life. And I forgive him. And because I know that I have worked through lots of those things, and I know he's listening. And I know he understands. And he's here right now. 
And that's a wonderful thing. Mm. It is a wonderful thing. And all he needs to do now is start reflecting, and it's going to be a painful process of reflection for him to get into this state where he's actually feeling sorrow about the choices that he made and what he inflicted upon his children and, and in particular yourself. I had an emotional investment in staying the victim, yeah. his daughter as a victim. Yes. And I no longer have that emotional investment. Yes. And so I admit that out loud because mm -hmm. that's part of my repentance. That's right. And my error towards him. That's right. You see, when we stay in the anger, the emotion, you know, we're wanting something, aren't we? Mm -hmm. We're wanting something from someone else other than just feeling what we <laughs> need to feel. The truth is, all you, as you know now, Jen, needed to feel was your own grief, wasn't it? And, and a lot of other emotions associated with that grief. That's all you needed to do. Once you've done that, you're now in this state where you can say, you know, that I love my dad even though he did abuse me. But the problem for your dad at the moment is he's not yet there. He's getting close to that place, but he's not yet there. And in actual fact, my interactions with my father, the strength that I found to keep going through many of those difficult times has given me a strength of character now, mm. which is a direct result of the relationship with him. Yeah, but see, be careful of that reasoning, though. Yeah. You've got to be careful of that reasoning, though. Because that reasoning does not help your dad. Do you understand why? Because he could actually then go down the line of saying, well, you know, I made Jen stronger by what I did. Right? And that's not the truth. The truth is, in your pristine condition, you would have been strong anyway. Right? That's the truth. And, and the damage caused you to become in this weak, vulnerable, victim-like condition. That was caused by the damage. And now you've recovered from that, that's fantastic, but don't justify that to your dad because that's very dangerous for him because he'll then go down this justification road and not allow himself to see the true impact of what he's done. Every single emotion you've experienced, he needs to just flick through your emotional experiences now over your life and see the direct result of his own actions. That's what he needs to do. And he needs to allow himself to do that and he'll feel tortured by that but he needs to allow himself to do that and allow himself to be in this state of sorrow and remorse about that. I was commenting uh, this morning, uh, I think it was to Mary, that the people I've found around the world who've found the divine path the hardest are the people who feel fully justified in damaging other people by their holding on to their own emotions. <coughs> They just find the divine path incredibly difficult at the beginning. <coughs> you can see why, because the divine path involves repentance. And many people don't want to get into a state of repentance. A state of repentance is a state of humility. And we could have a whole discussion about humility as a separate issue, but this state of repentance is about humility actually seeing the truth of what you've done and how it's impacted upon every single person around you. Why is it sometimes that we can be driven, I'm talking personally here, um, with a desperate need for the person who's wronged us to, to admit, a particular parent, the next parent, just, if you could just tell me, just admit, You're sorry. You if you could just feel and repent to yes. me, Yes. Then my mercy grace, can, I, I can heal them. I can, you know, that whole um, lie in the sense that we believe that we're so driven for that person to repent in order for us to then go, oh, I can heal them. The truth is that it does make it easier for you to heal if your parents repent. That's one of the reasons why repentance is such a powerful thing and why God loves it. It's because when a person repents, the persons that they've affected are automatically more enabled to heal. Right? They're, they're, free, they're freer of their emotion. But what drives the action inside of us is our own desire to not experience the grief of what they've done. So in other words, we don't want to fully feel all of the effects of what that person done to us. We want them to feel it. We want them to pay it, not, not ourselves. right? And so that's what drives that action. 
But the truth is actually that if you get into a state of repentance and you're a parent, that will make it immensely easy for your children to actually grow on the divine love path as well. Just by you getting into that state. Because you know what you'll probably do? You'll sit down with your children at some point and you say, I have done so many things wrong with you that I can't even count them now. Like I realise now just how bad it's been. And you'll be crying with them probably, telling them the bad things. And they'll say, no, that wasn't bad, Dad, that wasn't bad. And I'll say, no, don't you, no, don't you do this. That was bad, you know. Look, look at the effect, like I've sat down with my boys and said, look at the effects of how I interacted with your mother and how you now interact with the women in your life. Like it's terrible, like Tristan is still paying the price of that, of my actions there. And I've had discussions with him and feel this really deep sorrow inside of myself about, you know, my creating that emotion in him. And we need to allow ourselves, when my discussion with him about that has enabled him to face those emotions even more than he would have before. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the beauty of repentance. There's a lot of things repentance does, not only to your own soul, but it opens up the soul of all of those people you've harmed. What a gift for today. Thank you very much. <laughs> So does everyone understand that? That's what I wanted to make sure that everyone understands this law. Yeah? Please help me with that. When I do repentance and I do what I want with my clients, I fall into this relentless shame and guilt at the same time. And it's so really hard to get out of that. If we go into repentance and then we stay in this terrible shame and guilt place, then we're not getting a causes. We're not getting a cause. So pray to God, long for God to show you what the real cause is. Because <coughs> you're not getting at the cause. You might be crying about something, but you're not getting at the cause if you're still feeling... Well, really sometimes I do. Well, sometimes, sometimes you do, sometimes but... I do, but often there's guilt attached to the guilt. Yep. It's just there. So, so why, does guilt, why does guilt attach itself to you? You judge guilt. Guilt is your choice, and if you need to listen to this carefully, guilt is your choice to not feel the full effects of what you've done. Guilt actually enables you to do it again. Does everyone understand what I mean by that? Guilt enables you to do something again. See, what happens is, let's say you've done something that you know now is bad. You feel guilty about it. But is that guilt releasing the causal emotion? No. 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 So what's the guilt going to let you do? <coughs> you, see, what you start ending up with is you end up feeling like the guilt is my penalty for doing that wrong. So what did we start doing? As long as I'm willing to feel guilty afterwards, I'll do it. <laughs> and that's what we end up doing. How many, how many of you have had fidel infidelity after infidelity, you know, or seen it, and the person's felt guilty and ashamed, but have they done it again? Yeah. yeah. Why? Because they never got to the cause. And guilt prevents you from getting to the cause. So, rather than choose the guilt, which is a way of preventing you from getting to the cause, allow yourself to pray about that, that you're actually choosing guilt over getting to the causal emotion. So the causal emotion must be pretty big, if you're allowing guilt to get in. So you need to face that. I didn't know it was Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a choice. <coughs> but you don't need to know what the cause was. No, I said, don't misquote me, <laughs> because I did say, that, so, that many times you will know exactly what the cause was because of the linkage between the two, but not always because some of the causes will be way, 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 way... It could be in utero. Stuff. Like, like in, yeah, in utero or even, you know, first few years of life that you can't yeah. even remember, yeah. right? But if you're willing to be completely... to see the full effects... Remember, repentance is about seeing the full effects of everything you've done in that person's life. Now you imagine that, to see that, for example, let's say, let's say when, you was, when, when your child was three, you smacked that child for crying. 
And now standing in front of you, you have a 30-year-old son who you're trying to encourage to connect to his emotions. Right? What a hypocrite. Well, no, it is hypocritical, isn't it? You smacked out of him his connection to his own grief. And now you want him to connect? But you've realised your error. Have you? If you're reasoning, with, if you want oh, your son to do it, you haven't realised your error. I see what you're saying. If you realised your error, you would feel grief over it yourself, feel repentance, pray to God about it, and ironically, once you've done that, you'll find your son will automatically get into grief. But while you're trying to get him into grief, are you sorry? No, you're not. Can you see it? You're not sorry at that point while you're trying to get him there because you're not recognizing what? You created his state. And if you're not recognizing that, are you there? No, you're not there. Hey, Jay. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, where does regret come from as an emotion? Yeah, well, I suppose it's. I suppose you could say regret and remorse are similar emotions. But regret can often be felt, and it's often felt by spirits, they just regret where they're at. So in other words, let's say, um, you see this a lot with children, right? A child comes and steals something. The parent comes along, and I'm not saying this is right, but the parent comes along and gives them a smack, right, for stealing. Right? Now, the child will often regret that they got caught. So what do they do the next time? They don't get caught. They don't, do you see what I'm saying? That's not remorse. Remorse would the child would actually feel like they'd never want to do the action again. Not do the action and not get caught. Now you think about that many times in your own life. How many times have you done things seemingly and then had regret afterwards but only had regret because you got caught <laughs> or you know you got some consequence because of what you done you know you look at how many men cheat on their wives and the only time they ever feel regret is when they got caught that's not remorse that's not repentance true repentance focuses on the core emotion within me that created the event so the man who's truly repented with his with his wife if he's cheated on her he will be looking, not, he will not only feel remorse about what he's done to her, so he'll feel all the emotions of that, he will actually be crying, you know, he'll be in a terrible state for quite some time, to be honest. He will be crying about all of the harmful and painful things that, that's happened to her. Not only that, he will actually be looking at what caused him inside of his soul, the emotion inside of his soul that caused him to, de to desire another woman other than her. And he will deal with that. He will release that. Then he is really sorry. And then is the wisest time for her to have him back if she wants him back. How do we connect with all of these events that we may have caused 30 years ago to our children if we don't remember them? Like, will prayer bring them, bring them back? Yeah. The truth is, if we don't remember something, it's because we don't want to. But do we need to specifically remember every single thing? Can we just... Oh, I've remembered hundreds of things. Thousands of things have been my boys. Um, yeah, you I'm a lot will, older than you are. You will remember lots of things. You will. You will remember lots of things. Your soul inside of it has a complete record of everything you have ever done. And you are totally capable of recalling every single one of those events if you wanted to. And you know what Alzheimer's is and stuff like that? It's not wanting to. Not wanting to remember. Not wanting to. Right? So let yourself start wanting. This is why these kind of diseases like, you know, dementia and Alzheimer's are becoming so prevalent today. Because nobody wants to remember that what they've done. It's a big thing. It's a huge thing. So my suggestion is is over the coming month or so that we between when we see each other now and, and again I'm not sure when that will be if you can just think about these principles of forgiveness repentance and think about how your repentance and the effect that it has on God 
and see God as a parent who's just waiting to hug you and remove the cause, that it can only happen if you are truly remorseful for those things. If you can see God as that parent, God's already forgiven you, God already loves you, it's just a matter of you feeling these feelings before you will actually open your heart enough to feel God's love into you. Does that apply to things you could have done but didn't do? It applies to everything you thought you wanted to do and didn't do. I think, no, but now looking back, I could have done those things. Yes, it does. Okay. It also, this, this applies to sins of commission. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. As well as sins of omission. It replies to both. There are many things where we were in a certain situation where we could have made a choice harmoniously life and we made an opposite choice. How many times last week could have you chose to tell the truth and you chose to not say anything? So you stop doing it. Repent from that, you know? Get into the state where you see the damage of what you're doing when you're not telling the truth and talk to God about that and get rid of that emotion that causes you to feel so afraid about telling the truth. Can you see that? Can you see now, can you start to see now too how much the divine love path isn't just dealing with your emotions but how much it involves truth and how much it involves your heart completely, all your desires, all your passions, all of your longings. It's a big thing. But you've all listened to me for long enough, surely. And it's been lovely talking to you all again. Um, I'm not sure when our next session is going to be. Oh, CDs, you've got... Uh, so everyone turn around. If you, if you haven't got a CD, that's Liz, who's holding those CDs. That's what they look like. If you want a CD to read some of the pageant messages or anything like that. Um, there's DVDs of previous sessions that people, what we do is we tape record these sessions. The quality isn't always fantastic, but a lot of the quality is pretty good. And what we do is uh, we sell them out there at cost price of what they're being to, to produce. And so they're all quite cheap as well. And so if you want to have any of the other sessions that have been taught, that's fine for you who knew. Um, the next time we see each other, and I'm thinking sort of late January, because yes. uh, by then everyone will be over this silly season. So. And does that sound pretty good to everyone? Yep. So sometime late January? Peter? And there is a, uh, for those people who didn't notice it, there is a donation box uh, because uh, AJ's uh, work is supported 100% uh, by donations. So if you uh, have a feeling you'd like to donate, go ahead.